Coming up, a brand new round of your voicemails. Get answers to questions such as, can babies be demon possessed? Should Christians get the vaccine? Should I tell my husband about my affair? Hear Pat as he weighs in on your biggest issues about life and beyond. Are you once saved, always saved? What is the mark of the beast? I see dead people. What does it mean? Tune in for a supersized edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Vox Populi, the voice of the people. Today is the day we feature your voicemail questions on the air throughout our program. So get ready for three riveting rounds of your questions and honest answers coming up. But first, take a look in the news. The escalating border crisis, a surge of up to 1,000 migrants a day crossing the border, hundreds of them violent criminals. So what's being done to try to stop them? Here's Ephraim Graham. Pat, border officials arrested and encountered more than 100,000 migrants at the southern border in the last four weeks. That's the most for the month of February in the past five years. About 700 to 1,000 people are illegally crossing the border every day. Most are single adults, but the numbers of families and children are also increasing. Agents are now holding more than 3,200 unaccompanied minors in facilities similar to prison cells, which are not intended for children. Tuesday, Texas Governor Greg Abbott declared a crisis on the border, pointing the finger at the Biden administration. This crisis is a result of President Biden's open border policies. It invites illegal immigration and is creating a humanitarian crisis in Texas right now uh, that will grow increasingly worse by the day. Abbott claims the surge is from ending Trump-era policies of returning people who cross the border illegally, as well as making asylum seekers wait in Mexico. He also said Border Patrol agents captured 800 criminals since the beginning of the year. Meanwhile, Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody is suing the administration for policies ending the deportation of violent felons. First, they canceled Operation Talon, which targeted sex offenders here in the United States illegally. And now they've released guidance, which is basically releasing into our streets serious criminal offenders. They're canceling detainers and requiring our law enforcement leaders to release them back into our state. The AG says she's going to hold the administration accountable in federal court. A powerful new White House counsel aims to promote gender ideology across the federal government, but critics say it actually threatens women's rights. Jennifer Klein, the new head of the Gender Policy Council, says it will promote gender and gender identity. Critics say it's based on a confusing and harmful new social construct, which could abruptly end advances for women and girls by allowing boys and men to change their gender identity at will. The name is nice, Gender Policy Council, but it's not about advancing women. It's not about advancing girls' interests. It's not about protecting sex-based rights. It's about enshrining gender identity across the federal government and making policy decisions on that basis. The council's broad scope and access to cabinet secretaries mean it could profoundly change U.S. policy both at home and abroad. Computer hackers broke into a Silicon Valley company, gaining access to 150,000 surveillance cameras, live streaming from companies, hospitals, police departments, prisons, and schools. The hackers launched the attack to show how widespread video surveillance is worldwide and how easy it is to break into systems and to gain access. One video reportedly shows staffers tackling a patient and pinning him to a bed in a Florida hospital. Another shows Tesla workers on an assembly line in Shanghai, China. Pat. Well, thank you for those stories. And now, folks, for the what you've been waiting for, and we've all been waiting for it. And Wendy, what's next? That's right. Up next, we've got your voicemails. Pat's about to answer your voicemail questions. Stay tuned for a special edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers. That's coming up next.
Hi, this is Pat Robertson. We don't know what the future holds for different tech companies, but we always want to be able to share the good news through the media. So I want to invite you to watch our program on CBNFamily.com or download the CBN Family app. This way you can have direct access to the 700 Club and other specials from CBN, and you won't miss a thing. Now just click below to get more details and watch with us. Tomorrow, ISIS worst nightmare. <laughs> the daughters of Kobani. They weren't just fighting ISIS, but they were leading in battle. Meet this female fighting force. Women were front and center. See how they're winning the war on terror. We will fight until the end. And inspiring young girls around the world. They are real and true warriors. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Welcome back to the 700 Club. It's a special edition of your voicemail calls and Pat's answers. We're going to start with this one from Ben, and he's from Grand Forks, North Dakota. Here's Ben. Hello, Pat. My name is Ben. How do you walk in love, but yet not be walked all over like a doormat? Seems the nicer you try to be, the more people try to take advantage of you. Well, I, I think the Bible talks about suffer yourself to be defrauded. But you remember um, uh, Moses was considered one of the meekest men in the world, but he, is, he was in charge of a whole country. He was tough. And I, I believe there's such a thing as tough love. I, I don't think we ought to be walked all over. I think we ought to stand up for our principles. Sometimes we have to fight for them. So there's nothing in the Bible that says you've got to be a doormat, all right? All right, let's go to Cachetta, Louisiana, for this call. I'm a faithful viewer of the 700 Club, but I'm baffled and puzzled about something. I am a born-again Christian, and I'm wondering why I've prayed exhaustively for the last five years for God to restore my vision, and I prayed, and I waited, and I'm still waiting for God to hear. Tell me. What is it that I could be saying or doing wrong? Or should I just keep praying and believing and waiting on God? Uh, what is she asking for? She is praying for the last five years for God to restore her vision. And it has her healing hasn't come yet. And she wants to know, All should right. I be doing something different? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is you need to wait on the Lord and rest on him. Now, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. So first of all, you know, do you have anything you're doing that's wrong? Secondly, you ask yourself, uh, have I got all against any? If you hold a grudge against somebody, you'll never get your prayers answered. So ask yourself those things and then <clears throat> believe. <clears throat> you know, the Bible talks about accepting belief. I receive what you're doing, Lord. Wendy? That's good. All right. Here's Betty from <laughs> Pittston, Pennsylvania. I was wondering what should be done when your pastor leaves the church and a new one comes in, and it's a woman. She has had a husband, three children, but she left her family for a member of the same sex. Should she be preaching in the church? She shouldn't be preaching in any church I'm involved in. <laughs> wow. I mean, I think that is outrageous. I mean, not only is she uh, living, apparently committing her adultery, but she's taking up with the sex, same sex union and she's going to be pastor. I, I don't know whether those people in that church have got the little screws in their head of the deacon's board of, of calling such a pastor. But um, there are a few denominations that they're okay with that. Well, the, you know. The, but that, the Bible's not. <laughs> well, the, the, that Wendy is beyond the belief. I mean, she's she's left her her own family and then picked up in this deal. Um, folks, sin is sin, and uh, if the church is weakened, it's going to ruin our society. So uh, you just don't. You say, "What do I do?" Well, you can protest or you can go get another church. All right. Amen. All right. Here's the caller, Lisa from Fallen, Nevada. 
My question is regarding demon possession. Can babies be possessed? And if so, does the age of accountability come into play for salvation? Oh, I, I, you ask about the age can, of accountability. Can, can babies be possessed? And if so, does the age of accountability oh. come into play for salvation? Well, the age of accountability has to do with at the point you know what, what right from wrong, and that normally doesn't take place till you're old enough to understand something's wrong. So the age of accountability can be five, it can be six, it can be four, it can be three. But uh, can a baby be demon possessed? Uh, I, I just believe if 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 that child is born to a family of devil worshipers, there's a real possibility that that the the, the devil will think that uh, he has a, a claim over that child. I mean, it, it's horrible to contemplate, but. Uh, I don't think they, they are protected in some fashion uh, from uh, what's, it, I mean, a generational curse. But normally a little, a little baby, as I say, there's no such thing as, as, a, as a sinful baby because a baby doesn't ever know he or she is doing anything wrong. So they are free from the law, but not necessarily free from the influence of Satan. All right. All right. Here's a question from Claudia, and she's from Hawthorne, California. I have a question. If you ask God to forgive you for the same sin that you keep committing over and over, does God still forgive you of that sin? You remember what the, the Lord talked about forgiveness to one of his disciples said, how often do I forgive? Seven times, and I said seven times 70. But um, you're committing a sin. I think you need to understand that there's demonic power and that sin that you're committing may well be <clears throat> instigated in your life by some kind of demonic influence. So I think not only do you need to repent, but you need to have deliverance. And, and somebody needs to cast that thing out because that's not normal. All right. All right. Good word. Here's Carson from Glen Rock, Pennsylvania, with this question for Pat. I have a question. What does Pat think about Christian comedians? Is this right in God's eyes? Chris, Christian comedian. I tell you what, it's it's tough to find material these days. They used to make a lot of fun of, of Donald Trump. Now they're having a hard time with Biden. Um, you know, I've, I've found that a little difficult because it is so easy to edge over into blasphemy. And I know there was one particular comedian. He kept making jokes. The next thing you know, I think God took him. He died prematurely. Wow. And I, I think uh, being blasphemous is on the edge of this, this humor. And I, I think we've got to be very, very careful about making jokes about the sacred things of God. All right. Here's a question from Amy. She's from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. My question is, when you pray on the show and have a word of knowledge of someone getting healed, if I'm watching the show, can I claim that healing for someone else that is not watching the show? I don't ask any question. You know, the promises of the Bible for everybody, I mean, it may, it may trigger something in your heart and you say, this is mine, but uh, the Bible was for everybody, so I think... Any word that the Lord uh, speaks, if, there, if there's a blessing, it can be, it's available for everybody. All right, that's good news. Here's Dee from Radford, Virginia. I'd like for you to explain to me what the Apostle Paul actually said in 1 Corinthians 11 about a woman's hair. I've been taught for most of my life that based on what Paul said here, it is a sin for a woman to cut her hair. What did he mean when he said a woman's hair is her covering? I, I think uh, he's going back to Jewish tradition uh, that, uh, you know, again, you, you go through the whole idea of you know, a woman has to pray with her head covered. So you find people in churches that have a little thing on their hair um, or they wear a veil or a hat or something like that. And uh, he says the, the, the Lord is the covering of the man, the man is the covering of the woman. and. Uh, on account of the angels. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that he said in there. But I honestly don't believe that uh, that's something normative for Christians today, that women have to cut their hair in a particular way or wear a particular style. And you look at some of these so-called holiness women, the old days, they used to pound up something on top of their head that looked like a, a tower of pizza. I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. So I, I, I don't think that's normative for us today, frankly. 
All right, that's good news for all of us that like our hair. Okay, here's Rod from Austin, Texas. I have a question concerning Melchizedek. He's mentioned in Genesis, the Psalms, and in Hebrews. And I want to understand the significance of Melchizedek and how does Melchizedek fit into the biblical picture. The word Melech in Hebrew is king, and Sedek is righteousness. So he was the king of righteousness. And when Abraham came back from winning uh, the battle against those people in Sodom and Gomorrah, <clears throat> he met Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God, and he gave a, he gave a blessing to Abraham, and Abraham gave him a tithe. Uh, uh, and the Bible says he's without father or mother. Well, we're, the reason that we don't know where he came from, but king of righteousness and peace, and so he was sort of symbolic of something. But I, other than that, I don't think there's any significance to the fact, except. If you want to know where you give your tithes, it's where you're blessed. You know, where you're blessed. The, the, that is the Abrahamic concept. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Here's Cindy from Midland, Michigan. I was wondering why is it that I have asked to be saved over and over and over again, but I just don't feel that presence of the Holy Spirit or that I've been forgiven or saved in my heart deep down inside. I feel that I might not be in the rapture. And this scares me deeply. Is it just my head over my heart or my heart over my head? Uh, clarify that. I, I didn't quite hear She's it. She's asked um, to be saved saved over and over. She just doesn't feel it in her heart that she's oh, been saved. That's it. Well, I know you want to go out in the rapture and, and be part of the kingdom. Look, if you do what the Bible says, believe it. Now, if you don't have a witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart that you've been sinned, then ask yourself, have I really committed myself to the Lord? And, and if you do, take the Bible and believe it. And so the, I've got to be saved over and over again. Once you've made that commitment, uh, you, the Lord will accept you. You don't have to get adopted over and over again. You know, she's saying she doesn't <laughs> feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, Can you ask the Lord well, to let uh, you feel of it? Of course, uh, you know, but, you know, as many as are born by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God, and the Spirit will bear witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Yeah. So there'll be a witness in your spirit. If you are living for the Lord, uh, you'll, you'll love the brethren, for example. You'll have a love for the people of God. You'll want to be with the people of God. Uh, you'll be open to prayer. You, you, there's something about your life that'll change. And if, if you, that doesn't happen in your life, then you ask yourself, have I really, really surrendered to the Lord? But if you have, then you should have that witness in your heart. All right. Amen. Here's Judy from New York City. My question is, in the book of Psalms, in some of the Psalms, they have a word in there called Selah. I would like to know the meaning of that word and why it's only in some particular verses of Psalms. That's, that's just a, 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 a little thing for the choir director. It needs a pause, right? <laughs> well, it's sort of, sort of the idea. Yes, Sila, but I mean, no. But in, in this case, I think you read those things. Those songs were meant to be sung, and I think it's a choral matter, and this is essentially, hmm. that's all it is. It's not part of the song. Sila. Right. <clears throat> it's pretty work. All right, here's Helen from Florida. My question is, some Pentecostals say very pridefully that you must have the second baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues because they have it. Well, I know this happens. I believe in it. But does God work exactly the same in every life? I, I don't think we ought to put God in a box and say, well, you've got to do it this way. You've got to do it the other uh, but uh, I do think when the uh, Holy Spirit came upon people, uh, their uh, highest sense senses, the speech senses were activated, and they began to, to praise God. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't winning people to the Lord. They were worshiping God. They were magnifying the Lord and talking about the Lord. And uh, they were speaking in other languages so other people heard them. Uh, but to, to say, well, you've got to have this or you've got to have the other, I just don't think, I think God is infinite. And I, I just think to, 
create some kind of theological box to put him in is a mistake. But um, Paul said, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. So he did. And I stand before you, sit before you. I do the same thing. I don't do it more as much as Paul, but I have had the experience of speaking in tongues, can worship in tongues. And he, the Bible says, he that prays in the Spirit edifies his spirit. So it's not a bad thing to do. But to say, you've got to do this or you've got to do the other, I, I just don't buy that kind of theology, all right? All right. It's a great tool to have, though. If oh, you... absolutely. It, 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 but he that prays in the, in, the, in the Spirit edifies himself. That's what the Bible says. Exactly. All right. All right. Here's Lance from Red Oak, Texas. My question is, you recommended for people to get vaccinated. Have you got vaccinated yet, Pat? You know, I'm waiting for that one-time deal. Um, the hotel we have here is, is, is a site for vaccination. My dear wife has gotten the first one, and she's due in another two or three days to get the second one. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely, this COVID is so deadly, what it does to your mind, what it does to your lungs, what it does to your muscles. And uh, I, I think the idea of the, these vaccinations are all safe. Uh, but uh, I'm waiting for the one that you, you get one time, the Johnson and Johnson, and it's it's all. I, I'm, I'm in that category where I'm I'm at the top of the line <laughs> because of my age. So, but I, I think it's a good thing, and I think everybody ought to do it. Yeah. I don't blame you. I I think one shot is plenty. For, I mean, you have to get two. But my my parents are in their 80s. They've both had both shots. They did great. My 100. A year old mother in law just had her second shot yesterday and she did fantastic. Yeah. So praise the Lord. And well, I, I recommend it. And I think, from what I understand, they're absolutely safe. So get them. Get them. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, coming up, we've got round two of our special voicemail edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers. Will you hear your voicemail question played on the air? Well, stick around to find out. You might. It's like a double punch. You get the COVID, then you get the hurricane. People have lost just about everything, business too. There's been no electricity now for days. We had to stand on long lines to get food for COVID and everything, and then this hit. Pastor Jerry Snyder and his wife Hope partnered with Operation Blessing to host a food and supplies distribution at their church. We're giving out fresh produce. We're giving out products that they need to clean. We're giving out food, trash bags, dog food, all the things that they need. Thank you, Operation Blessing. Thank you, every partner that sows, that gives, that cares. We feel it right here in Southwest Louisiana. Thank you. People around the world need your help. When you partner with CBN, you rescue children and adults from despair, and you give them a promising future. Please watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. When we all come together to help, miracles happen. Hi folks, this is Pat Robertson, and I want to thank you for watching The 700 Club. Now make sure to click the subscribe button below so you'll never miss an episode. The team at CBN always reads and responds to your comments and prayer requests, so keep them coming. Tomorrow, ISIS' worst nightmare. The Daughters of Kobani. They weren't just fighting ISIS, but they were leading in battle. Meet this female fighting force. Women were front and center. See how they're winning the war on terror. We will fight until the end. And inspiring young girls around the world. They are real and true warriors. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. California lawmakers are considering a bill mandating how children's products are displayed in large department stores. It would force retailers to offer toys, clothing, and other kid oriented items in gender neutral fashion or face a $1,000 fine. Products would have to be together instead of a separate boys and girls section. And online stores would have to separate pages for children, unisex, or gender neutral. Israel is reopening most of its economy this week, including restaurants, gyms, and malls. Some of the COVID restrictions had been in place since September. We feel very good about reopening the restaurant. Um, we've been closed for six months. 
Um, we feel lucky that we can host people again, give them great food, great music, see the light in their eyes, um, make them and us happy again. Um, it's very important for us to do it, so we feel very happy about it. Some businesses did not survive the lockdowns and certain places are only open to those who have been vaccinated. Nearly 40% of Israel's population has received both doses of the Pfizer vaccine. And you can now get a head start on your day by subscribing to CBN News Quick Start. Get the latest national, international and faith-based news delivered to your email each weekday morning. You'll also see a preview of stories in the works and find topics of interest from overnight. You can subscribe at quickstart.news. Pat and Wendy are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Do you have questions about God? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000 or check out this link. I spent many years here. Now available. And I've returned with a message. I am Patrick. Get your DVD with 4K streaming access for a gift of any dollar amount. Also included is your special access to the St. Patrick's Day premiere of the I Am Patrick theatrical release with exclusive bonus content on the CBN Family app. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit IamPatrick.com today. I Am Patrick peels back centuries of legend and myth to tell the true story of St. Patrick. For your gift of any dollar amount, we will rush you a DVD copy of this exclusive story. You will also get instant 4K streaming access to watch it on your computer, phone, or smart TV through the CBN Family app. Plus, on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, you'll get access to a special premiere of the theatrical release on cbnfamily.com. It includes the full documentary plus a special pre-show segment and additional content. So visit iampatrick.com or call 1-800-700-7000 or you can text Patrick to 71777-71777. So again, for any gift, any dollar amount, you'll get all three, a DVD copy of I Am Patrick, instant 4K streaming access and access to the March 17th premiere. And it is so inspirational. Okay. Are you let's, ready? For let's go more? for some more questions. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's go. All let's right, dive right in. Gail from Eaton, Ohio, has this question for Pat. Hi, Pat. This is Gail. My wife and I would like for you to describe a typical day for you. The average day when you get up in the morning and go to bed at night. I can't go into all of that, Gail, but I must say the most important thing in my day is that I spend time uh, talking to the Lord. I really, really need to to uh, talk to him before I do anything else. I also uh, I try to eat some breakfast, but I, I have a call at 8.30 in the morning with our producer, and we go over the uh, news items we're going to talk about and see if I have any suggestions, and he's got some, and I've got some, some news, so we talk about that, and then um, I, I, I read the Word for a while and then get ready to go. So I'm on the air by, by uh, well, I, I'm here uh, in the chair at, at um, by nine o'clock, but uh, I'm 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 over here in the studio by eight, and then all day long it's a, something else. All right, that's because enough. you're running our university yeah, as well. I'm a university, <laughs> and I have some other uh, uh, issues, and I've got some investment activities I have to do, and there are a whole bunch of things, and so I, but I'm also thinking about what to do next. I mean. You know, I'm, I'm thinking particularly about the program we've got to do tomorrow because I, I think there's some very important things, and, and we break some some news stories. But I'm also I ask the producers tell me about uh, what spiritual things, and I'm asking the Lord, look, God, I, I I need your anointing. I want the anointing for wisdom, and 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 I want to be able to speak the word that people will be healed. So I mean, I'm really crying out to God, and I think that's the most important thing. I said, Lord, I just got to hear from you. Before I go on the air, you give me wisdom, and like before this program, take my mind and uh, yeah. let me give your answers to people's questions. All right. All right. Thank you so much for that. All right. Here's a caller from Sparks Glencoe, Maryland. I have a question concerning spirits. I occasionally do see dead people that I have known in the past, and some I have not. One was my father, who has been dead for 20-some years. Does this have any significance, any meaning that I may be 
ready to pass myself in time. So I hope you can answer the question. I know it's an odd one. There are things called familiar spirits, and I think those spirits have to do with your, your, your family members. And those who contact them are called mediums. And <clears throat> mediums are, uh, you know, uh, pr prohibited in the Bible. Uh, I think if you're, you're seeing, the, the danger is, is when you think you're in touch with Aunt Minnie who's passed on, and suddenly she's giving you advice, you're in trouble. And these familiar spirits before long want to take over your life. So I, I don't think it's a wholesome matter at all. You, you may, I, I, in my opinion, I don't know your particular situation, but if I were you, I would rebuke that thing and ask the Lord to set you free. All right. Amen. Here's Michelle's question. She's from Chesterfield, South Carolina. If everything is preordained, what control do we really have over our life? You know, I, I um, when I was in seminary, I was wrestling with the whole idea of, of uh, free will and predestination. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, that's what it says, work out your salvation. And then it also says, for it's God who works in you to, to will and do his good pleasure. So here you've got God's preordination and everything, and then you've also got your work. And so I, I thought it was like a basketball game. So you've got guys down the court, and the visible players are the ones that score the points. But there's an invisible team behind them uh, who really are controlling the action. And uh, uh, in order to, to have stability, you have to have tension between both of them. And so God does, you know, if, if I wanted to see a movie, I see it real at a time, you know, and you think, well, it's ongoing action. But if, if you took that film and laid it out, you'd see the whole thing in front of you. Hmm. So God sees everything in front of him. He knows what's the end from the beginning. But at the same time, he doesn't take away free will because there's an opportunity for people to exercise their free, free will. So to, to, to be, you know, have orthodoxy, you have to have a tension between them both. You cannot say, well, it's all God doing it or it's all me doing it or everything's ordained, so why should I try? You know, it, it doesn't work that way, okay? Yeah, God doesn't want puppets. He wants children. Well, of children. course not. He, he wants free, but, but he's given us freedom, but he knows he knows what's going to happen. But, I, you know, it's a difficult thing. As I say, I, I was in seminary and trying to work it out, <laughs> and, and we still have all got the answers to it, all right? All right, here's a question from Donna. She's from Lubbock, Texas. I've been married 30 years. The first five years of our marriage was not very good, and I was constantly in and out of having affairs, so I was not faithful. But after that five years, I went to God and asked for forgiveness of my sins, and I repented, turned away from that lifestyle, and I haven't ever done that again. So my question is, do I need to confess this to my husband? Uh, look. I don't think that we need to bring up all the sexual activity that we haven't been engaged in uh, before or after or doing. Um, you know, you sinned against God. If, if, if that thing is, is standing in the way of intimacy between you and your husband, then you need to confess it. But if, if he doesn't, isn't aware of it, he, he'll keep throwing it up in your face, you don't need that. So I don't think there's anything that says you've got to confess it to him. And I especially think it's true of what you did before you got married and that sort of thing. Yeah. I think, I mean, everybody's had his own little conquests or failings or uh, romances or whatever. They're in the past. So I, if I were you, I would live for the, the present and the future. And But if that uh, adulterous affair is blocking the intimacy between you and your husband, then you need to open up and tell him about it. But if it's not, I'd go ahead and live your life. Yeah, all right, good word there. All right, here's Max from Vero Beach, Florida, with this question for Pat. I'd like to ask, how do you walk into the blessing of the Lord in all matters of life? Everything from spirit, soul, mind, body, finances, walking in abundance. Well, I, I, I think that... Uh, you just, you know, the, the Lord was talking about uh, 
uh, the souls, the seed, the, the sower that was sowing seed, and certain seed came up and it didn't have any root and it died, and others uh, uh, found good soil and yielded 30, 60, and 100, and others grew up among thorns, and the cares of this life and the deceitful riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You know, we live in the world. We, Paul said, you, you use the world, but you don't abuse it. Uh, we have to earn a living. Uh, you've got to do your craft, whatever it is. You have to you know, go to work, and you, uh, whether you're a secretary or you're an accountant or you're a lawyer or whatever you do, you've got to worry about those cases. And, um, and that's part of living in this life. So God's not going to take you out of the world. But in all of it, you're giving God the praise. And I remember that book about Brother Lawrence, he said, called Practicing the Presence of God. He was a scullery cook. And he was in there washing pots and pans. And he gave, it, it, it was service to God. And every time he cleaned a pan, he was doing it for the Lord. And whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That's what the Bible says. But we, we, we live in a world, God knows that. And so you, you have to, you know, don't worry about the fact that you have to do things in the secular basis, but don't let the cares of this life and the deceitful of, of riches choke the word. That's what you got to be careful of. All right. All right. Amen. Thanks, Pat. All right. Let's go to Canada for this question. Patty from Ontario. Go ahead. I suffer from a lot of pain, so I take pain medication. I've tried to get off the pain medication and trust God for a healing, but I tend to go back to the pain medication because it's just pain that I can't take. I was wondering if that would disqualify me for not having enough strength to believe that I can get healed by God. Am I going to be disqualified for taking pain medication and not allowed to be in heaven? You know, there's a Sackler family that used to, they, they were big on pain. And they went around to doctors. They said, look, you've got to do something to deal with pain. So they had this uh, something called oxycodone and oxycontin. And uh, they hooked more people on these pain meds. It was a shocking, absolute shocking. But it all had to do with pain. And he went to all these doctors, and they said, well, you can't let your patients have pain. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking an aspirin. I, I mean, you know, you can believe God for a, to heal a headache, or you can take an aspirin. I, I believe in healing, but if you don't believe in healing, then uh, there's nothing wrong with taking medicine. I think that medicine and doctors and the skill that are in the, uh, our medical profession is a gift of God to all of us. And I don't think we're disqualified before the Lord because we seek the advice of medicine. Uh, we have at uh, Regent University, we've got a school of healthcare sciences, and we're training nurses, and, and uh, uh, we believe in medicine. So I, I don't think... Uh, it's sinful uh, to take medicine. But at the same time, uh, if, if, if God wants you to believe God for healing, then that, that's between you and him. All right? Right. Here's Paula, and she's from Spokane, Washington, with this question. I've always wondered why Aaron, Moses' brother, wasn't punished for helping build the golden calf during the Exodus. Other people were severely punished, but he seemed to retain his position and title. So she's wondering why Aaron, Moses' brother, was not punished for build, helping build the golden calf uh, in the Exodus. Other people were severely punished, but he seemed to retain his position and title. Well, um, I, I'm not <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, he, he, he said, well, they gave me this stuff, and I threw it out, and they out came this calf. I mean, he tried to duck it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sure God dealt with him severely, but uh, I, I don't know. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance, the Bible says. And so he was gifted as being high priest. And yeah. He, I, I, it's a good question. I have no idea why he wasn't punished. That is good. I really don't. All right, well, let's go to Stan from Chula Vista, California, with this question for Pat. Yeah, this is Stan. I want to know how do you break away from a porn addiction. It's been really hard. I know God forgives many times, but I just need to break away totally. 
Give me that one. He's, again. he's, he's like, uh, I want to know how do you break away from a porn addiction? He's tried many times. Uh, that is one of the most serious addictions. It's worse than anything. Look, in order to establish a habit, this is, this is a rule. You've got to do it for 21 days. So day one, I won't watch porn, okay? And then, the, then day two, I won't watch porn. Day three, I won't watch porn. Don't make a resolution. I'm going to give it up for the rest of my life. But it is a terrible, terrible addiction. It, it's one of, uh, it, it, it goes to the senses. And I, I think it, it, is, it is artificial. And the people who are setting these things up do it to profit by your lust. They want to make money on you. And the porn industry is huge. So they are trying to take advantage of you. So what you've got to say is, I do not want to be a tool of an industry that wants to destroy me. But do it for, I mean, I'm talking about 21 days. Count it off in your calendar. I didn't watch porn today. <laughs> Next day, I didn't do it today. Right. Next day, I didn't do it today. Next, and then don't watch dirty movies. Don't watch pictures. Don't look at, uh, at uh, underwear ads, don't look at all that stuff. There's so much. Look, everything they've got to think, he's got to have some kind of a sexy woman to show, the, to, to advertise these products, everyone. And they're trying to use you and make, and they're trying to make money on your lust. That's what it amounts to. So just say, I'm not going to be a tool of these exploiters, period. And the, but 21 days and you'll be free of it. And you ask the Lord to set you free, but for 21 days, watch what happens, okay? Amen. Help him, Lord. All right, here's Shirley from Dallas, Georgia. My question for Pat is, is tithing from the gross or from the net? We would like to make sure we are in compliance. Well, you know, I, I was, when Jim Baker was Secretary of the Treasury, we, we met for a meeting, and he was so sharp, and what he wanted to find out whether you were supposed to have a tax uh, deduction on the basis of your gross income or your net income. And uh, uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, if, for example, you run a grocery store, your net is about 3% of your sales. You have huge sales, hundreds of millions of dollars, but you, you only net 3%, maybe 4%, but that's about it. So if you were to tithe on the basis of your growth, you couldn't do it. I mean, you just couldn't on the basis of growth, so you couldn't do it. And I think it's the same thing with your own income. Figure out how your own income works and then, and then decide it. I don't think God isn't some accountant with a green eye shade sitting in heaven trying to figure out, um, you know, I, I'm going to get him here because he didn't give like he's supposed to. Mm. Uh, but, you know, gross or net, I mean, I, I, I think the money that you actually receive after all your expenses is what you ought to give your tithe on, not, not your gross income. Amen. Right. I used to tithe on the gross, and now I'm glad I tithe on the net well, because you, it's, you, it's I mean, hard. If, as I say, if you're a grocery store, you couldn't possibly do it. You'd go bankrupt. Yeah. All right. All right. Here's Joanne from Franklin Borough, New Jersey. My question is to Pat, is it biblical that we can rebuke a disease from a person and laying on hands, is it still biblical today? I must that. Uh, is it biblical that we can re rebuke a disease from a person and lay hands on people and rebuke it? Well, is it still I, biblical? Sure, it's biblical. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure laying hands on demons is the biggest, best thing in the world. But uh, you speak, and the one thing I want to caution people about, don't try to play head games with Satan. Do not, because Satan is the father of lies, and he's, he's a deceiver, and he will trick you. When Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, was being confronted by Satan, he did not argue with him. He just said, it is written, it is written. So know the word, but there's nothing wrong with rebuking Satan. I, I think that is the most important thing. Uh, you know. I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil. Do it in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bind you. And, you know, uh, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. that that's that's, that's okay. biblical. Very that's good. God. All right. All right, here's Lisa from Lancaster, California. Do we have anything in Scripture that would lead us to believe of any other life on other planets, particularly Mars? 
Absolutely not. You know, uh, you, you look at Mars, there's nothing up there. You know, the truth is most of these planets are just dead, lifeless items. And some of them are hot, some of them are cold, depends on the sun. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, the gentleman that we think so highly of, that uh, Hugh Ross, he thinks that, that when there is an influx of spiritism, going on, that they, all these sightings suddenly take place. And, 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 and he thinks a lot of it, a lot of this, these little creatures, the creatures from outer space and, and uh, you know, E.T. and all that stuff, it, it comes out of demonic spirits. That, uh, I don't think there's any other life. I think this planet we're on is uniquely fitted for us. And the universe around us is tuned for life. And the wonderful thing is this planet was where God decided he was going to set forth the plan of, of redemption for the entire universe. And so this, this, this earth, earth we're on is a wonderful place. And I, we all just praise God for it. But I'm not thinking about anything in law. They're talking about a spaceship to Mars. I mean, who needs it? It's a bunch of empty rock up in the uh, in the sky, and it may be too oh cold gosh. or it may be too hot, but who needs it, you know? Okay. Yeah, not me. I want to stay right here. <laughs> I'm happy nice. with this world. It's with a all great the oxygen. World. This is my father's <laughs> world. I rest me in the thought. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, still ahead, we've got more of your voicemail questions, round three of this special edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers from Pat, coming up next. Stay tuned. Do you want to know more about having a relationship with God? Call us at 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club, and this is our final segment today of your voicemail questions for Pat. We're going to start with Sharon. She's from Blackstone, Virginia. Hi, Sharon. I just have one quick question. In the Christian world, people are always talking about the two different sides of one saved, always saved. Could you tell us your opinion on that statement? Uh, I certainly do. I, I think that the most terrible thing is that I've got a doctrine that says once I've, I've made a decision, I can live as I want to live and I, I'll go to heaven regardless. And so it's a cover. Uh, for any kind of conduct, and that is wrong. But uh, I, I, I just believe the, the, the Bible says that if anybody is born of the Spirit of God, he does not keep on sinning. And I do believe that if you have come to the Lord, you are adopted into the family of God. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And if you really have come to Jesus Christ, I think you can, you can rest yourself in the fact that you're a child of God. You know, it wouldn't it be terrible if you adopted some kid and every few days he said, I wonder if you're going to kick me out of the house? I mean, wouldn't that be awful? Uh, but you say, look, uh, Johnny, you're part of the family. You're my child and you're part of the family and, and you're, you're here until you grow up. And I think that's the way God wants us to be. He wants us to, to rest in his assurance, but we should not use that as a cover to go out and do what we want to do. Uh, as Paul said, you know, you say you will sin boldly that grace may abound. He said their condemnation is just. Okay, so that's... Yeah, that's okay, I, I, I hope I answered that. Well. Yeah, very good. All right, All right. Good. here's Roxana from... I, I hope I'm saying this right. Catanning. Catanning, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Katani. I would like to know why in the Old Testament, the kings and the people had so many wives. And now I know in the New Testament, we don't. Could you answer my question? I love 700 Club. <laughs> in those days, you know, they had a harem. And the, the truth is that uh, in order to uh, have uh, some extra population, uh, David had two wives, for example. I mean, he... he he, he had one, two with him, and, and uh, the others have had uh, the harems. Uh, I, I believe that uh, a, it, 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 population increase, but um, we... It uh, wasn't just for, for, to well, have a variety the, I, the, of women. The Bible says, you know, a pastor should be the husband of one wife, and I, I think that's, that's appropriate. 
Uh, but uh, somebody said one wife at a time. But I, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I am absolutely not certain that uh, polyamory and some of these things is necessarily sinful. But it's a, it, the reason it was against the law and that therefore, you know, the Mormons and others were, were held accountable and, and they were run out of certain areas because they, they believed in, in having uh, multiple wives. But uh, can you find anything in the Bible? The, the, the New Testament says the elder should be the husband of one wife. Hmm. And uh, that certainly has been a, a wonderful thing. And I totally concur with it. But how come the kings had the, the privileges? Because they, they had harems. And the, the, that was part of the, of the culture of those days. Right. Okay. All righty. There you go. Good answer. Here's Kenny from Daytona Beach, Florida. My bipolar twin brother is homeless when he's not in jail. He's attacked me several times in front of my Down syndrome daughter with no remorse. How do I get over the guilt of not helping him when he's homeless? Uh, look, you do what you can do, but, I, you know, you can't leave your brother. He's, you said he's bipolar, which means the old term used to be schizophrenic. Uh, and he, uh, he needs to be probably institutionalized and uh, to, to, to love him. But uh, you don't have to have somebody in your house who's going to try to kill you. Uh, you just don't. So why should you feel guilty about it? But I, I, I do think if you want to help him, I think the best thing to do is to get some sort of institutional help. Perhaps he needs to be institutionalized. The Supreme Court had a ruling that has been devastating where they let a lot of these people go and they, 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 uh, they wandered the streets because they, they, they are not able to take care of themselves. So if you really love your brother, that, that I would get institutional help. And he probably needs to be having some place of, of confinement where he's not allowed to go loose and, and hurt himself and hurt others. Mm, yes. So how do you get over the guilt? Well, just know that uh, you know, you've done what you could for him. And then that's it. You don't have to feel guilty. All right. All right. Amen. Here's Janice from Kansas City, Missouri. When we get to heaven... Pat, what happens with the Holy Spirit? Does he stay with us, or does he have another role then? So when we get to heaven, what happens to the Holy Spirit? Does he stay with us when we get to heaven? Of course. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're in heaven. We don't leave the Holy Spirit. Uh, I wake up, and thou art with me wherever you are. And uh, that would it'll be an intensity. We will be spiritual beings in heaven. We will be spirits. And we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And of course, the Holy Spirit will be there. The, the, you know, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be present forever in heaven. And um, he doesn't leave. Uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And so the Bible talks about uh, he that restrains will be restrained until he's taken out of the way. But the Holy Spirit is never taken out of heaven, ever. Well, today's power minute is from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Well, tomorrow you're going to meet the first female sprint car driver to win at the Knoxville Speedway. And you'll hear what happened when she saw Jesus in the cockpit. So you don't want to miss tomorrow's program. And I've got some other important things for you, but I won't tell you about it now, but you don't want to tune in and find out. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> A couple years ago, Angela started her own in-home daycare, but when enrollment numbers dwindled, bills piled up. It's been very difficult financially. I didn't know where we would have our next complete meal. When a friend told Angela about Operation Blessing Partner Warehouse of Hope, she was astounded by what she discovered. My first time coming, I was amazed by the amount of food that they gave me. Be able to put a whole meal together and not break the bank to do it, <laughs> it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Everything that you all are doing is such a blessing. There's no words that can express how I truly feel about that. People around the world need your help. When you partner with CBN, you rescue children and adults from despair, and you give them a promising future. Please watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. When we all come together to help, miracles happen.